Great, let's begin. Um, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces here today. Um, this is our uh, first webinar of the year. My name is Jeremy Tamanini and I'm the founder of Dual Citizen. Uh, we are a US-based consultancy that provides data analytics and research to help measure and promote uh, sustainability. <clears throat> A couple administrative points before I begin the presentation. As I already mentioned, some of you may have entered under the link I sent this morning, which is fine, um, but it may be labeling yourself as me, my name, Jeremy Tamanini. So if you do want to um, edit your name, feel free to do so by clicking on your profile and there's an option to rename and you can enter your actual name. Um, most people seem muted, which is great. Um, I'd love to have uh, some exchange and questions after the presentation, which will be around 25 minutes. <clears throat> if you do have questions, feel free to raise your hand. That option should be uh, possible in the Zoom frame. And um, when I see your hand raised after the presentation, I can unmute you so that we can hear your question and have it answered. <clears throat> Good, so I'm going to share my screen now to begin the presentation. Good, so today we're here to talk about survey results uh, from a survey that was conducted recently titled Getting to a 2020s Green Breakthrough. Um, this survey was conducted as part of the Global Green Economy Index, which is a global index measuring how countries perform in the green economy related to climate change, sector decarbonization, green finance and the environment. And this effort through the Global Green Economy Index has been going on for 10 years now. And we decided in 2020 on this 10 year anniversary to approach the GGEI slightly differently. And over the past decade, we've developed a large database of experts in the green economy space who have been providing us feedback periodically on how countries perform um, in the different areas that we measure. And we decided this year to leverage this database um, and these experts to assess what happened in the 2010s, what some of the successes and areas for improvement were, and then how can we apply that to 2020 in a way that can scale and hopefully realize um, much further uh, green progress globally. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about today is the results from that survey um, that was distributed to our expert database. Later this year, also as part of this 10th anniversary Global Green Economy Index, we will be um, <clears throat> looking at um, another part of progress from the past decade and um, trying to see what levels of green progress have been realized since 2010 in the 130 countries that we track. So this survey um, was conducted from January 28th of this year through April 1st. Um, it was distributed, as I mentioned, to our um, online database of experts and we received around 2,000 um, responses. So there was a lot of interest and engagement uh, globally. And as I said, all of the respondents here were individuals that were practitioners in the climate change space, sustainable finance, um, CSR, and the environment. It was a short survey and it was divided equally between questions that looked at issues from the 2010s and then other questions that looked at issues or um, themes going forward into the 2020s. And obviously the um, COVID-19 pandemic emerged globally during the survey period, actually right in the middle of it. And that's something that I'll talk about at the end of the presentation and how some of the um, 
feedback and, and learnings from, from the survey results might be impacted by COVID-19. So getting into the results, and I want to start here in the 2010s, the one big question that was driving this survey was, I think all of us have, have seen a, a pretty sharp increase in awareness and attention around uh, climate change in the past decade. But there's also been a frustrating lack of progress around key indicators, particularly related to carbon emissions and a lot of um, environmental topics. And that's frustrating. And so one of the first questions that we asked looking back at 2010 was, what were the main drivers of this increased awareness around climate change? And the survey respondents were pretty clear that highly publicized severe weather events was, in their view, the main driver of this increased awareness. There was less credit given by respondents in our survey to political leadership or even the scientific community as drivers for this increased awareness. So that's interesting. Um, it definitely, severe weather events are definitely something that get a lot of media attention. And from my point of view, I often see um, media coverage making the linkage between climate change and these severe weather events more explicitly. However, respondents were pretty clear on the survey to point out a disconnect here, um, saying that communication in their minds should not um, be so explicit about linking these severe weather events with the phrase climate change, as many of them said that that phrase has come to have elitist or vague uh, connotations among the general public. So something to think about from a communications perspective related to this finding. Another broad question that we asked around the 2010s where we received fairly clear responses had to do with what the main drivers of progress were in the past decade. And respondents were clear around two areas here. Uh, the first was market factors. There were a lot of responses that um, mentioned the sharp decline in the price of renewables, carbon taxes in some jurisdictions, and the proliferation of financial instruments like green bonds. The other key area that was cited around this question were people-driven movements. So more grassroots movements like Fridays for Future, uh, fossil fuel divestment movements on um, college campuses or more broadly, or local efforts um, to promote plastics ban bans. And this is an interesting finding that we'll see throughout the survey results where there's this real emphasis on these two areas that are not always um, interconnected very clearly, the market dimension and then the more grassroots dimension. We also asked more specific questions related to the past decade. One of the most important events um, from the 2010s was the Paris Climate Conference in December of 2015 and the resulting Paris Climate Accord. And we asked a specific question here around what could accelerate action around um, this accord. Um, either, and we weren't specific about in the past five years or over the next decade. But um, two clear answers that we got here were there was a lot of um, emphasis from the survey respondents on uh, needing greater ambition from developed countries, as well as binding targets um, as being the two factors that respondents believe could accelerate um, action around the Paris Climate Agreement in the next decade. But there also was a disconnect here that was pointed out by a lot of respondents um, where there were a lot of mentions um, or suggestions really to um, have a greater role for finance ministers um, in future negotiations as opposed to environment ministers or other representatives from government. 
I read or interpret this as um, linking back to the market forces point and perhaps uh, the ability of finance ministers within uh, national governments to exert greater pressure in that regard. We also asked specific questions around energy markets and what could reshape the fossil fuel dominance of energy markets in the next decade. And here we did got another very clear uh, response from our survey respondents where globally, and this did not differ from one country to another, respondents were pretty clear about crediting the strength of the fossil fuel lobby in different countries to advocate for <clears throat> continued subsidies um, and other <clears throat> um, factors that market factors that support the fossil fuel industry. And again, another disconnect here was cited and you're probably catching the, the, the pattern here about these disconnects where respondents also <clears throat> mentioned how they saw um, a disconnect between more grassroots climate change movements in their markets and this organized lobbying for different types of energy. Um, in this case, being um, the, the reality that many of the green energy um, uh, sectors don't have the organized lobbying behind them that the fossil fuel sectors have. And that's something I think a lot of us are seeing quite clearly now um, around the stimulus debates in different countries and how aggressively the fossil fuel lobby is pushing for um, support and that isn't being mirrored with the same level of engagement from these newer um, green energy sources and sectors. So those are some high level findings from the past decade. Um, and now I'd like to move to the decade coming up in the 2020s and share some of the key findings that we uh, found from our survey on questions related to the next decade. Um, a summary here, which has, again, some, some familiar points from the last decade. For the 2020s, again, we found a lot of respondents emphasizing these market-driven solutions um, in the overall global economy accelerated by bottom-up pressure, um, and I'll explain some specific examples about what respondents shared um, there, and then shaped by a much deeper um, embedding of sustainability and climate change issues in education at many different levels of um, the educational system. So the first question that we asked about the 2020s, which is also quite a broad question, was what um, had the greatest potential to unlock progress in this, this new decade that we're in? And by far the question, um, or the answer I should say, that received the most responses was placing climate risk at the center of decision-making, economic decision-making. Now, when you talk about climate risk, there are obviously many types of climate risk. There are risks to physical infrastructure, there are regulatory risks, supply chain risks, and we didn't disaggregate or get more specific into these different types of climate risk. But overall, this, um, this emphasis on climate risk and economic decision-making was the clear winner um, around this question more than technology innovation um, in different types of institutional leadership or even um, country level action among some of the countries that have the highest um, contribution to global um, carbon emissions like the United States and China. Um, and this was another disconnect that I wanted to point out here um, that we found in the survey results, there were a lot of um, calls for system-wide 
uh, changes, I would say, in sort of how the global economy factors in things like climate risk, but less emphasis on country-specific solutions. And one example that really stood out had to do with coal. And there were a large amount of um, respondents that were uh, very keen to have asset managers uh, removing coal from, from portfolios and, and investments that they make. Yet at the same time, there was almost no um, emphasis on countries, um, state-owned uh, coal producers in countries like China and India um, being subject to the same type of uh, limitation. So that was just an, an interesting disconnect that we saw in the results. Now, the next question looked at implementation and how this a notion of green progress um, could be best accelerated within uh, key areas like government, the private sector, and, and society at large. And across the board, we found this emphasis on bottom-up pressure here. So this is mirroring a bit the um, opinions from the 2010s where there was this real emphasis on grassroots movements. So here, for example, um, with regard to governments and, and what could most um, successfully accelerate um, progress within governments, respondents clearly said, you know, it's voters. It's really having the energy and focus on these issues among voters that would translate into greater responsiveness and action from governments. Same thing or similar theme with companies. The uh, overwhelming feeling among our survey respondents was that investor pressure and investor really, investors asking for this um, accountability and action from companies is the, the best way to realize progress in the next decade. Similarly, with changing minds overall in society and mainstreaming these topics further, respondents felt that grassroots movements had um, the most um, chance of, of achieving that, of really breaking through in new ways. Now, we didn't ask a specific question around education, but I included it here because there was such an overwhelming um, mention and uh, citing of education um, by survey respondents when they had the option to fill in the blank and provide their own um, their own recommendations for what would would most um, accelerate green um, green progress in the next decade. I, I think more than fifty percent of our respondents um, cited education um, un unprompted. And so I felt it was important to include it here. And when they talk about um, education as this critical underpinning um, to building bottom-up pressure um, on governments, on companies, and, and just at large in society, there were a lot of specific examples. Um, many respondents mentioned how climate-related instruction should be mandatory in uh, primary and secondary education. Um, there were also several mentions around a theme that I hadn't thought too much about, um, which was shifting the perceived impact of climate change from animals to humans. Um, I guess that's um, mentioning the, the idea that um, there's perhaps a perception in the general public that climate change is something that impacts nature, which it does, of course, um, and animals, but not humans. And that's partly to blame or explains the lack of human urgency um, around climate change. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and the, another, something else that was mentioned frequently was mainstreaming this topic to a wider range of stakeholders um, within education, particularly business schools. Um, and I think this links back again to the market theme and the idea that 
if there were more uh, instruction in MBA programs and business schools globally around sustainability, that that training would uh, translate to more progress and innovation around the topic in, in businesses where these men and women um, progress to as their careers evolved. So how can we unify further um, the findings from the two decades um, through this survey? As I've mentioned already, um, a key takeaway here is that in both decades, the combination of market solutions and bottom-up pressure to achieve them were notable. Um, and also in both decades, there was a frequent mention of a disconnect. Um, and, and one of the main disconnects um, tended to be between those who design and implement these market solutions and those who lead grassroots movements. Um, and that's, that's an important takeaway in my view because um, there's a lot of energy and momentum right now that I see um, in the subnational space, in the private sector, and then also within the grassroots. But it often feels like those two groups are speaking slightly different languages um, or may even have different goals. Um, and that appears to be something that could deserve more scrutiny and needs could be reconciled in impactful ways. Um, my just personal take on this um, disconnect could be that we're talking about sort of two different groups of citizens or uh, practitioners. Um, the market segment uh, may have more belief uh, that markets as they're currently efficient uh, configured have the efficiency and the potential to address the problem of climate change versus um, another set of citizens who may believe that the system itself um, is fundamentally unable to address this problem and needs to be reconfigured from the bottom up in some way. So again, that's my personal um, editorializing um, it, or reaction to, to this finding as opposed to something that was uh, explicitly shared through, through, the, um, through the survey results. So I'm going to just wrap up with a few um, comments about what these survey findings mean in the context of COVID-19. Um, please, as we go to the question and answer session coming up, um, raise your hand um, if you have questions or comments or reactions. I love this uh, webinar to be as interactive as possible. So please, um, please raise your hand so that I can call on you in a few minutes when the presentation is complete. Um, a few things just contextualizing uh, these survey findings around the pandemic. Um, Stimulus is a big topic right now, and there's frustration in a lot of the Green New Deal movement um, that, you know, the, the price tag on some of the policy proposals there was viewed as so um, unattainable and unrealistic. And then suddenly, within um, the first month of the pandemic, something like $8 trillion, uh, globally in U.S. dollars was mobilized. Um, and there are different, re there, there are different um, arguments around that. But um, one interesting um, uh, research effort through an organization called Vivid Economics that sprouted up in the past month is something called the Green Stimulus Index. And they've looked mostly uh, just at OECD countries and actually um, analyzed um, where the stimulus is going, what kind of sectors. Um, and they found in their um, last most recent update, which I think was looking at 11 or 12, mostly OECD countries, that 90% of stimulus was going to individuals, households, and those on the front line of the pandemic, um, which makes sense, with 10, the remaining 10% going to what they categorize as environmentally intensive businesses, um, not um, 
it, businesses, um, energy sectors that are viewed as green or more sustainable. So this is a concerning finding um, because most economists that I've been listening to over the past month or two have emphasized how uh, stimulus of this size doesn't just keep happening um, across a decade. Um, we may be looking right now at um, one of the only opportunities we'll have in the next, in the foreseeable future to um, to realize this type of, of global stimulus. And if it's not happening in a way that's supporting or redirecting towards more um, sustainable sectors, that could be a problem. Um, it also emphasizes the important role um, for markets here. And, you know, obviously the, the market theme has been key throughout my presentation of these results, but um, some ideas that have come up lately around linking stimulus and government action with the market. Um, things like the government's requiring um, greater sustainability transparency as a condition for public bailouts or other types of um, taxpayer funded support. There were also ideas about um, government setting certain uh, targets around electric vehicles or renewable energy that recipient companies would be obliged to um, agree to as a condition for accepting uh, bailout money. Um, and, and I think the other point that, that many um, on the corporate side have been saying is that the adaptation to the post-COVID uh, world from um, an employee management perspective, um, et cetera, could come for some companies at the expense of um, sustainability and greater focus on um, sustainability uh, performance uh, within the company. Um, lastly, the last point before getting into some questions and discussion, um, the COP26 has obviously been uh, delayed uh, until 2021. Um, and that was said to be a big deal conference. Um, the five-year anniversary was going to be this year, and a lot of countries were um, being pressured to up their targets, their 2030 uh, emission reduction targets. That's been delayed now. It's being uh, complicated by the um, COVID-19 pandemic, um, both in terms of um, framing and how the conference should be framed uh, next year, but also from an analytic perspective. Um, projections now are, are seeing um, that we, we might see an eight to 9% reduction in um, global um, emissions in 2020, but how permanent is that? Um, what is that, how's that gonna ramp up again? Um, it can affect a lot of the modeling that's gone into the country NDCs, and so that's going to be a lot to sort out um, as the COP26 gets underway um, next year, hopefully um, soon next year. I, I'm not aware that, that an actual date has been set yet. Good, so um, I'd love to get into some questions here. Just a reminder, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a moment so that I can um, get into uh, the questions uh, with individuals. But just a reminder, if you have a question, um, raise your hand through Zoom and um, formulate your brief question um, or comment about the presentation and I will uh, do the best to answer it. If for some reason I can't answer your question or don't have the information, at hand, I will um, follow up with you um, over email. One other um, reminder to everyone, um, and I will uh, post. I will post the um, link again in the chat box. But um, there is a link to the um, survey findings where you can see the raw um, survey results at a later date. And I'm going to paste that again right here so that everyone has it. <clears throat> 
Good. The first um, question that actually has come in um, over email has to do um, with how these results are actionable. Um, the question specifically was, um, how are some of the um, findings from the 2020 um, survey questions actionable to different stakeholders in the, um, in the uh, global green economy? And that's a great question. Um, surveys, in our view, you know, they, they have um, utility um, as uh, maps or roadmaps, um, often more than as definitive um, answers. Um, and one answer to the question I would give is I think from the perspective of um, NGOs and, and issue, issue defining, the survey can be helpful um, by zeroing in on what some of the um, areas to focus on in terms of building campaigns, particularly around the grassroots. Um, as I mentioned in, in the presentation, a lot of the um, respondents mentioned this disconnect between grassroots movements and um, markets. And I think that that's an area where NGOs in particular can play a key coordinating role to perhaps um, bridge that gap a little bit and make that um, marriage um, more, more efficient, more, um, more impactful. So that was um, a question that came in. I'm not seeing any questions come in in the Zoom box right now. Um, so let me just check here. I um, definitely am happy to take any. So um, I don't want to force anyone to to ask questions, but um, we can wait um, a little bit if um, any do come up. I see one here. <clears throat> one just came in on the chat box. Um, what do you see as the implication of the survey results on key areas um, of knowledge generation? Um, that's a good. That's a good question. Um, I think that there's a lot of ways to take that question. Um, knowledge generation um, has a, a huge role to play in terms of stakeholder education, um, and I would say that education is a big piece there. Um, a lot of the responses around education, in addition, to, um, in addition to talking about embedding um, education more in business schools and um, the private sector, um, there was um, a lot of comments would where they also were suggesting that there were just huge knowledge gaps that existed, um, particularly in the private sector, not understanding in different sectors what sustainability means, um, how to define it in uh, one sector uh, opposed, as opposed to another. So I think to answer the question, I think um, the implications are that knowledge generation perhaps can be more targeted and more specific in the 2020s um, to different sectors, um, as opposed to being maybe more broad um, and globally oriented as a lot of uh, knowledge generation was in the past decade. Um, Questions. There's some comments coming in that people don't see the hand raise. Um, and I'm sorry if that's a problem for some people. If you don't see the hand raise, you can, um, you can do so. You can ask your question by typing it in the chat field. Another question um, from Andrea Bassi. Hi, Andrea. Thank you for uh, this question. What do you think is the potential impact of the trajectory out of the COVID-19 crisis 
we could recover quickly or the recovery could be slow. A quick recovery will lead to higher energy use and hence possibly trigger more climate mitigation actions. A slow recovery will reduce energy use and hence may lead to more emphasis on growth with uh, whatever policy investment that will increase GDP. Yeah, this is a really um, big question and one that um, we will actually, with Andrea, who's the questioner here, be um, rolling out some really interesting findings in the next month or so related to this very question of how trajectories um, are going to be changed in terms of consumption, um, energy use, and emissions growth or decline in the next um, few years. It's tough because, you know, I've asked this question many times um, myself in the past couple months where obviously the moment we're in now and, and the, the shutdown of economies is not um, sustainable. It's going to open up again. And one of the biggest questions about opening up again that I, I think no one really knows is the consumer dimension. Um, we just don't know how consumers are going to act um, when things become somewhat normalized again. Um, will they, you know, travel in ways that they did before? Um, will they think about um, consumption differently? Um, will, in terms of just household consumption, will they start to see in broader ways um, some of the um, linkages between um, consumption and um, emissions and other types of, um, of problems related to climate change? Um, one thing that I hope for, and that could be a positive outcome from this, um, this horrible period we're all living through with the pandemic, is that system-wide um, impacts of, or system-wide system approaches to public health, to the economy, to climate change, might become more mainstream. It's possible that um, larger segments of the global population will internalize just how vulnerable and interconnected we all are on some of these global issues, be it the pandemic or global climate change. And potentially um, that could lead to um, some acceleration around um, climate mitigation efforts in ways that we weren't seeing um, before the pandemic. Another interesting question um, just came in. Um, it was asking, do you also see a disconnect between civil society activism and the larger social protest movements with a broader range of claims? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> it's not, just to be clear, um, we didn't get into that level of um, specificity um, in the survey. So any answer that I'm um, providing here really is more observation or, or personal opinion. Um, I think disconnect is um, maybe too strong a word. Um, I think that um, there's obviously a lot of overlaps um, between some of the goals. Um, for example, a lot of the climate um, change movements and activism have a lot of linkages to global movements that are looking at income inequality and other types of social inequities or looking at um, more specific environmental topics like um, biodiversity um, is a big one. So I think that there's always going to be um, shades of difference. And I think that a lot of that also has to do with geography. Um, I think that, you know, depending on geography, you know, how different populations live, um, whether they are countries that are um, more technologically driven, more 
linked to agriculture. Um, those are going to those are going to impact priorities a lot, and what type of um, energy and focus there is around um, these different types of movements. So I think that there have been um, different priorities, but I think that what's starting to happen is that there's starting to be d discussion about linkages and how interconnected a lot of these global issues are. Um, so I would speculate to, to address your question directly that we may see some coalescing and greater coordination um, on the ground, literally, but also thematically um, in the coming um, year or two as we, as we move into the, um, the next decade. Yeah, the, the, uh, just to go back to the hand raising issue, it seems like a lot of people are um, still having um, issues finding the, the hand raise. So um, again, feel free to um, enter any questions that you may have in the chat box. I think that's a, an easier way to um, address them. The next one that just came in, how could technology be leveraged to empower communities um, and achieve a 2020s green breakthrough effectively and efficiently. I'm glad that the question addresses technology because that was um, an area I was quite surprised in the survey that wasn't emphasized more. Um, there was actually a specific question, the first question around the 2020s that asked respondents to um, pick the, the area they thought could, could most quickly accelerate green progress, and that's where climate risk in economic decision making was such the clear priority among respondents. And one of the options there was um, technology innovation and the power of technology to accelerate um, breakthroughs in these ways. It received, I think it was eight or 10% of the um, responses, which for me was a surprise because I see around me um, so many examples of how technology can be leveraged. You know, on a community um, basis, a lot of the app based um, reporting that is being enabled now around air quality is really interesting. Um, being able to get really localized air quality readings, water readings, um, and scale and communicate that data throughout communities is so impactful, um, not just in terms of policymaking, um, but also in terms of accountability for government. It gives citizens the um, ability to take the power in their own hands and put pressure on government around a lot of um, environmental topics. Um, also, we see with a lot of, and I'm answering a lot from a data perspective here, a lot of satellite, excuse me, some satellite um, based data gathering techniques that are wi widely, widely expanding the types of data that we can see related to um, forests and land use. Again, this is a huge innovation I see for the next decade in terms of tracking what's happening, um, holding governments accountable, and then informing smarter, smarter policymaking. Uh, further questions uh, related to um, the investors um, mentioning from the survey results that investors tended to decide not to invest in the carbon intensive energy sector in the 2010s. Could one still see an overall growth or decline in the global fossil fuel market? Yeah, just to clarify on um, what I was, what the survey respondents actually were saying there, it wasn't as much that the investors weren't um, investing in climate intensive sectors in the 2010s. Unfortunately, um, they were in a lot of cases. It was more that they saw the um, pressure, they saw that the pressure um, going forward on asset managers to not include um, energy intensive 
uh, companies, or I should say carbon intensive companies in portfolios that they promote to customers they, and clients, they saw that as a um, effective, effective strategy. Um, so I guess that's just a clarification on the findings that we, um, that we had from the survey. Um, I don't know the, the second part of your question about overall growth or decline in um, the uh, global fossil fuel energy market. Um, you know, and fossil fuels by all projections will continue to um, be a significant part of the global energy mix um, over the next decade. Um, there's nothing that um, says that that's going to, to change dramatically. Hopefully the, the trend will um, be towards greater, um, greater impact or um, contribution from renewable sources as well as um, reducing the, um, the impact, the, the footprint of, of those um, fossil fuel sectors. Um, David Ramsdell um, asked a question, um, how do you see survey results impacting overall XR strategy? Um, can you clarify, David, what you mean by XR strategy? I'm not familiar with, with, that, particular, um, with that particular acronym. Um, and then I can answer uh, that question. Another question that came in related to um, the, the survey um, had to do with the structure of the survey. And that's an important question because as any of you, as all of you know who have done surveys in the past, um, there can always be bias introduced based on the way you structure the survey itself. Um, and that um, is something that we're conscious of. We um, framed the questions um, around the, the themes and the type of uh, policy solutions that have been offered up so far in different markets. Um, we tried to really focus on themes that were big themes that a lot of people were talking about. Um, and in the, the answers, we usually gave about five answers um, to each respondent to choose from. And basically those, those responses as well were picked from fairly mainstream ideas that we've observed in the global dialogue around this topic. But we always allowed for each question um, a fill in the blank, so an other option. So we didn't limit respondents to the um, to the actual five responses that we were offering them. If they didn't think that one of those um, responses best answered the question to them, for them, we gave them the option of a, um, a fill in the blank. And then at the end of each section, so at the end of the 2010 section and the end of the 2020 section, we also gave them a general answer that didn't have multiple choice um, responses so that they could fill in the blanks um, there with their own ideas about the past decade and what to think about going forward um, in the 2020s. We have just a few more uh, minutes here. So please um, uh, just put in your questions in the chat box so that we can get to them. One just that came in, does the survey reveal any differences or similarities between developed and developing countries on drivers of a green breakthrough in the 2020s? That's a great question. And it's something in retrospect that I wish we did more clearly in the survey design to um, separate out uh, geography that way so that we could look more specifically at issues related to different types of country profiles. Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, we know that in terms of the respondents, and you can see this on the 
um, raw survey results that I will, um, that I've posted the link to in the chat box. They're very evenly um, distributed across um, the United States, the North America, um, Europe, Asia, Africa, um, and Latin America. So in that sense, I feel confident that we got a good cross section of um, respondents from developed um, and developing countries. But I can't say that we can really get to your question, which is what kind of approaches to green breakthrough might be more successful or relevant in like a developed country context versus developing, but fantastic idea for future work um, around, around this question, I would say. Um, any last questions um, before we wrap up? Um, <clears throat> this um, an, an, a question came in um, regarding um, the Global Green Economy Index, and that's um, a really a good way to wrap up because what we want to do this year, which I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, is to really um, use and leverage the Global Green Economy Index to look at some of these big picture questions. So for the survey, we've obviously looked at the past decade and asked about how we can improve um, for the next one. And um, the question that came in um, is about comparing the results from uh, the GGEI. Um, and a lot of those results for the past decade on the survey side have been how these experts um, judge and rank different country performance around the green economy and how we can um, compare those results with the results from this current survey um, and the idea of um, creating a link between um, the two in some way. And I think that's, um, that's a really interesting forward looking question. Um, I think that the, the timing and, and a lot of the methodological challenges with surveys taken in different periods and asking different types of questions can be um, challenging there. But I think that um, linkages um, with the past, but also, um, you know, just continuing to think about the survey portion of the GGEI moving forward as something that can be activated to ask some of these um, questions that are particular to the moment. Um, because we were really so um, pleased with the engagement and the high, um, the high number of um, responses that we got on this one. So, and, and also the feedback um, for ways to improve it. And I think that that's, um, that's a good way to sort of wrap up that if any um, participants in today's webinar um, have, after you review the raw survey results, have any feedback on ways that the um, future surveys that we do through this effort could be improved. That would be really useful for, for us to hear. Um, so for example, the question that was just asked about differences between developed and developing countries, that's a great example of improvement that um, that I'd love to hear so that the next time we leverage this list of, of experts through a survey, we can hopefully get to, to some of those questions. Good, so I I'm, I'm think it's time to wrap up now. Um, I wanna thank all of you um, for attending and please encourage you to uh, stay in touch with feedback or any um, remaining questions uh, that you may have related to this work um, on our website, um, which is www.dualcitizeninc.com. You can always find more information about the practice, the type of work that we do with our clients, the type of um, value that the Global Green Economy Index provides, as well as a lot of content and data that we release um, usually every month or every couple months through our email list to um, share our findings related to 
research and um, client projects that can hopefully enrich the dialogue um, overall um, moving forward. So thank you all. Stay tuned. There's going to be um, upcoming webinars in the next few months um, addressing uh, similar, uh, similar topics and themes. And um, I hope to see you all there. And I wish everyone um, safety and good health um, in this period. It's, it's a pleasure to see people virtually, um, not, um, not in person, obviously, but, um, but it's been great to see you all. Have a great um, rest of the day or evening and um, thank you for coming.